And stay tuned until the end because I'm going to share with you what I think the best scene of the show was. Just my opinion. And no, it's not the dragon scene. Um, so stay tuned to find that out. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. But what I would say is let's get right into that dragon scene because that's what clearly everyone wants to talk about. There is a lot to unpack with that. It is... It, do you know what? It's so funny that pre-House of the Dragon season one understandably there was that kind of bad feeling for many left by that stink of the last few seasons of game of thrones that seems like such a distant memory now this show has really brought back the westerosi love um I, pff, best show on tv at the moment i mean it, it's 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 a contender man it's uh it's it's, it's in that discussion isn't it the th that dragon scene was so pitch perfect in everything it does. Now, if if you're new to the channel, thank you for joining. But if you've if you've watched my videos before, you'll know that one of the things that I truly condemn, as I did on one of the recent episodes of The Acolyte, for example, is visual noise. That the act of trying to hide bad writing, zero character substance, and poor narration behind the mask of flashy things. Michael Bay likes to do it with his explosions. The Acolyte attempted to do it with uh, with lightsaber fights. Didn't hide the bad writing. And for those with a brain, you could just see right through it. Um, however, when you look at things the other way around, when you have good action, and for, the lightsaber fights in the Acolyte were good, but they weren't backed up by anything. And that's what I'm getting at here. When you have good action, like we had with this dragon scene, bolstered and supported by really engaging characters action set pieces that feel earned and not forced well then all of a sudden you're in a position and, and, and a narrative that holds together and there isn't dead on arrival now you're in a position where you've got this great action and because of all the things I just mentioned, that great action has now just been elevated to goated, goated. Because yes, am, am I aware that I'm watching CGI dragons and that it's not quite to the standard of, let's say, a triple A blockbuster movie that I would see in the cinema? Yeah, the graphics aren't that good, but f not even for TV, just they are very, very good special effects. And you look, e even the scenes where you can see I'm looking at a CGI dragon, yeah, for me at least you just look beyond that because again i've seen some people saying they don't like the show i mean bully them but for the most part the majority of people seem myself included seem to love the show and you look past you know the obvious flaws which are i can see that this is a cg dragon obviously um and you're just in the moment because you're engaged because you're invested in seeing what happens to these characters and they use the dragons as a vessel to tell such a brilliant character dynamic. And that's something I'll come back to after the section. But a brilliant character dynamic of the brothers at war and a woman basically bidding her farewells to the world. D d talking of the brothers, I have to say, I mean, I've seen some people online saying that, oh, it was an accident. Eamon didn't mean to do it. Power to you if you believe that. I don't quite get how you can interpret it that way. That Dracaris, that, that fire breath that he cast with it with Vagar, he meant to hit Aegon. Like, that was intentional, man. And I think the beautiful, beautiful subtlety of this show and of this scene in particular, when Sir Kristin Cole, Sir Bitch Boy, arrives to find Aegon's charred body in the dragon... And Aemond is standing over him, twizzling his sword, his little knife thing. I reckon if Sir Bitch Boy shows up a moment after that, Aegon ain't with us no more. I believe Aegon is still alive, which we're going to see in the next episode. Um, but I think had Sir Bitch Boy not showed up, Aemond would have killed Aegon flat out. In, he's probably disappointed that that didn't happen, and it's very going to be very interesting to see how things play out for Aemond moving forward but he is just such a brilliantly written character the the MVP of this entire season for me 
Like, he's loathable, he's hateable the way Sir Bitch Boy is. He's powerful and he's compelling the way the strongest of knights are. He's motivated by real fact. His eye was taken from him. He has been dealt a bad card in life. There, there, there are almost these moments, where, like like last episode, where they walked in on him in the brothel. They're, they, they, you almost feel sorry for him, despite how terrible a person he is. You almost feel sorry for him. And that is the hallmark of a truly, truly brilliant villain, where you get where they're coming from. You understand it. You don't, you don't justify it or agree with it, but you get why they are the way they are. And you almost feel a shred of sorriness for them in brief fleeting moments Amond is brilliant and on the note of Amond, that's why i'd like to bring this to what i thought was the best scene of the entire show because it of the entire well actually yeah the entire show the entire episode but i think the best thing we've seen so far in this season that scene at the table man the power dynamic shift between aegon to Amond. Aegon's really having a realization now that what Otto Hightower told him was true. It's like, you were put on the throne by design. We ascended you to the throne. This is nothing to do with you. Fall in line. Aegon's now realizing that everything Otto said was true. And he's trying to rebel against that. That scene where he gets up and says, you bore me, leaves the table, goes running to mummy, literally goes running to mummy and says, what would you have me do? And she answers him, nothing, do nothing. He should have listened to the woman because look what happens to him at the end of the episode. Should have listened to mummy. Um, and then they're at the table and there's this power dynamic where Aegon throws basically a king-sized temper tantrum about not being fully aware of what Aemon and Sir Kristen Cole are planning. And then Aemon starts speaking to him in, in High Valerian, making sure that the conversation stays between them, but also making sure that the rest of the room understands that the power is lying with him. It's beautifully poetic and subtle what he's doing here, but it's an age-old trick. You switch a language to assume the power in a conversation, and he lays out this master plan and makes Aegon think that this is the idea that you want, right? This is what would benefit you most, right? So you wouldn't be against it, right? And he tricks Aegon. The very obvious, not obvious, sorry, the very powerful yet subtle shift in who holds the power at that table, I thought was, I thought that that is go to TV. That is how you shoot a table scene, which is, you know, the no-no of any, of any movie or any, of any TV show where possible. Don't shoot table scenes. It's, you know, read any script writing book. They kind of say to avoid that where possible. Incredibly hard to shoot, also I've heard. And yet they somehow pulled it off here. And, oh man, just just go to TV. And yeah, well, what did you guys think? Like, leave your thoughts in your comments below. Do you agree with me that that was the best scene? I know the dragons would be an easy one to pull for, but let me know. Um, there's a subscribe button right here. There is another video for you to watch up here. So please go ahead and do all that for me. And I will see you next week for another review of House of the Dragon. I can't wait. I'll see you guys then. Bye for now.